of the lessons in this series on denominations, this is perhaps the hardest one that I've had to write. Not because the topic is hard, but because unlike when we speak of the Catholics and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians, which have a core set of beliefs, even though there might be splinter groups among them, when we speak of the Pentecostal church or the charismatic churches, we're not actually speaking of one united group, but rather splinter groups that generally believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and modern day miracles. There are Pentecostal Catholics. There are Pentecostal Evangelicals. There are Pentecostal Presbyterians. And you can find in many of the denominations a Pentecostal or a charismatic group among them. The movement itself, though, really began in the holiness movements in the late 1800s, with the holiness movement actually having its foundations in Wesleyan theology, which is the Methodists. Many of the groups there looked forward to the renewal of the Holy Spirit when the gifts seen on the day of Pentecost would return to the churches, hence the name Pentecostal. The Pentecostal movement, though, took off, however, in 1906 with the Azusa Street Revival led by William J. Seymour. The revival was characterized by spiritual experiences along with personal testimonies of miraculous healing and uh, of miraculous healing and the speaking in tongues. <laughs> Following this revival, many churches within the holiness movement became Pentecostal. In fact, as I said, many of the denominations will have a Pentecostal group among them. The names of the Pentecostal groups that you might see driving in or driving up the street are the Church of God in Christ, the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, the United Pentecostal Church, etc., etc. But because there are so many different groups, it's impossible really to pin them down as to holding to any one doctrine when it comes to Bible authority, sin and salvation, and public worship, which are the areas we've been focusing on in this series. So what we're going to do, and that's why you don't have an appendix uh, with all of the stuff that I usually give you, is we're going to discuss these issues in a general sense and then focus on some specific examples that I found in my studies. So instead of me saying, what do Pentecostals believe about authority, I have, what do Pentecostals generally believe about authority? On the websites uh, that you will find uh, for Pentecostal churches, you will find that they say that the Bible is the infallible word of God. I went to many Pentecostal sites, and usually about, uh, they, that will be up the top. And of course, they're right on that. The Bible is the infallible word of Christ. But then, when I went to the website that I posted up here, you find, you find things similar to what I have uh, listed. And that is that uh, the, the website is the International Pentecostal Church of Christ. And that is a blend... They're going to say they're there, the, Interna the International Pentecostal Church of Christ. They're saying we're a blend of congregational and Presbyterian systems of church government. And I'm going to leave you with that congregational, of course, congregation-wide Presbyterians has elders and, and hierarchies that way. So then they say churches operate under their own structures electing their own pastors and officers. Districts and national structures are overseen by various boards elected from the body. So that's one thing on one website. You go to another website, say this one, which is the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, and what you find there is the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada is a fellowship of more than 1,100 churches across English and French-speaking Canada. More than 235,000 people across the nation attend services in more than 40 languages. 
and we're pleased to provide ministerial credentials for more than 3,500 pastors and ministry leaders. We're also here to facilitate the vital work of spreading the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and bringing hope and help to those in need in Canada and around the world. So we see this denominational structure where they believe the body of Christ is made up of churches. What does the Bible teach about the church? Well, first of all, we need to go to 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to read verses 12 to 14. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized in one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we have been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. Now many people read that and say, Aha, see here, the body of Christ has many churches. But in that context, Paul is speaking to Christians. Paul says the one body is Christ's one church. That's the universal church in this context. That's what the word Catholic means. So when you go back to the early confessionals, you find that one holy apostolic Catholic church. And we often say when we see Catholic, we think of Roman Catholic. But that's not always what was meant through the use of the term Catholic. It's sort of like baptism today, how Baptism has changed meanings. Catholic means universal. And so Christians, when they said we are part of a Catholic church, we are a part of a universal church. But it is made up not of many churches. It is made up of many members, Christians. These are individuals, each doing their own role within the body of Christ. So you don't have... The East End Church of Christ and the West End Church of Christ and Strathmore Church of Christ and everyone else and say, well, we're a fellowship of churches. No, we're not. That's not what, uh, that is not what the New Testament is teaching here in 1 Corinthians, 4, in 1 Corinthians 12. We can be Christians. We can have fellowship with Christians, but churches don't have fellowship with one another, local churches. Worldwide, worldwide, oh, uh, let me see. No, I think I did. Yeah, I did do that. Worldwide, Christ Church contains Christians. But it does not, the worldwide church doesn't meet anywhere. It does not have elders and bishops and a conference or a synod to govern it. Instead, what Christ designed was that each locality would be made up of a congregation of Christians who would make up a local church. These churches would be of Christ, and that doesn't mean what the sign says on the front. Of Christ simply means following Christ. And they would be overseen by their own elders under Christ as head. So the East End Church of Christ is a local congregation of Christians. We are not part of another wide network of churches of Christ. We might have friends in other congregations, but we are not part of a network that way. That's not the way Christ set up his church. We see that all the way throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God, of God which is at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 8, Paul said, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to minister to you. There is one church, one universal church, but there are Christians who are part of many congregations of local churches. Each local church is autonomous, is separate, does its own work. We don't do the work of other congregations. We do our own work. We are involved with each other. We are grouped together together. We are not part of a denomination. And so we need to recognize that in the New Testament, this is the structure we see. We do not see conferences. 
We do not see synods. We do not see one church overseeing another church. We see one universal church in which all Christians are a part of when they're baptized into Christ, but local churches tasked to give its uh, tasked to do its own work under the elders that are uh, that are um, uh, among it. So that's what Pentecostals generally believe about authority. What about sin and salvation? What do Pentecostals generally really believe about this? And this is where you will get some differences. Some will affirm that sin is inherited from Adam, which of course is false Calvinist doctrine which we've talk, talked about before. Others will correctly teach that we become sinners when we sin. When it comes to the topic of salvation, I went to this website here, the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. And on their website they said, we, firm, we believe, teach, and firmly maintain the scriptural doctrine of justification by faith alone. And they cite there Romans chapter 5, verse, verse 1. Now, I'd like us to go and read Romans chapter 5. I'd like us to read verses 1 and 2 as part of that context. Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Bill has been teaching us to, when someone says something, and we're trying to teach them, to point out where they are correct and where they are not. They are correct in saying we are saved by faith. However, many people insert the word alone into verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith alone. That's what they see in that passage, but that's not what it says. The word alone doesn't appear in verse 1. It doesn't appear in verse 2. In fact, James chapter 2.24 says we're not justified by faith only, but a faith that obeys the will of God. Romans 5 is the, is the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. To understand what Paul's talking about, you have to read the first four chapters first. To understand, Paul's not teaching salvation by faith alone in the book of Romans. He is teaching the same thing James is teaching. Salvation by faith. Faith in God. We are justified by faith. A faith that does the will of God. So, these churches are, these types of churches are the ones who would view baptism as an outward sign of an inward grace. They come along and they teach baptism is important, but not necessary. And so it would be very similar to what we've talked about in other lessons on denominationalism. However, I also ran across this. This is the True Vine Pentecostal Church. It is a specific Pentecostal church rather than a group of them. And on their website, they said this. Water baptism is an essential part of New Testament salvation and not merely a symbolic ritual. It is part of entering into the kingdom of God, God's church, the bride of Christ. And therefore, it is not merely a part of local church membership. They would say, see John 3, verse 5, and Galatians 3, 27. Water baptism is it to be administered only by immersion. Paul said... We are buried with him, Jesus Christ, by baptism. Romans 6, verse 4, and Colossians 2, verse 12. Jesus came up out of the water, Mark 1, verse 10, and Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and came up out of the water, Acts 8, 38 and 39. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are applied to our lives when we experience New Testament salvation. Repent death to sin, and be baptized, burial, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, resurrection. See Acts 2.38, Romans 6, 1 to 7, Romans 8, verse 2. Sprinkling, pouring, or infant baptism of any kind cannot be substantiated by the word of God, but are only human traditions. Now you might say, that sounds a lot like what we would say. There might be some changes here or there, but that sounds a lot like what we would say. And the argument against infant baptism, argument for immersion in water, 
argument that it's not an outward sign of an inward grace. It is necessary for salvation. They're even using the same verses that we would use to show that. And so if we need to remember, if people are baptized with proper baptism, Jesus' baptism, like we talked about this morning, they at least become a Christian and thus simply need to come out of their error and obey the word of God completely. In that case, there is no need to rebaptize someone. However, and I say this with a big however, when you read the rest of their website, this is what, you, this is what you'll see. True Vine Pentecostal, te Pentecostal teaches that the one God who revealed himself in the Old Testament as Jehovah revealed himself in his son Jesus Christ. Thus Jesus Christ was and is God. In other words, Jesus is the one true God manifested in the flesh, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John 1, 1 to 14, 1 Timothy 3, 16, Colossians 2, verse 9. While fully God, Jesus was also fully man, possessing a full and true humanity. He was both God and man. Moreover, the Holy Spirit is God with us and in us. Thus God is manifested as Father in creation, as the Father of the Son, in the Son for our redemption, and as the Holy Spirit in our regeneration. The name in which baptism is administered is vitally important, and this name is Jesus. Jesus' last command to his disciples was, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, 19. We should notice that he said name, singular, not names. As previously, ex previously explained, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not names of separate persons, but titles of positions held by God. An angelic announcement revealed God's saving name in the New Testament. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, Matthew 121. The apostles understood that Jesus was the name to use at baptism, and from the day that the church was established, the day of Pentecost, until the end of their ministry, they baptized all nations, Jews, Acts 18, verse 16, Gentiles, Acts 19, verse 5, and in the name of the Lord Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the only name given under sorry, the only name given for our salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4 verse 12. That's a lot to take in. But what we need to know about th what they're teaching here is it is the false doctrine of modalism. Modalism is where sometimes God is manifested to us as the Father. Sometimes God is manifested to us as Jesus Christ. And other times he has manifested us as the Holy Spirit. This is what Bill was talking about when he talked about oneness Pentecostalism today. There aren't three persons of the Godhead. There is just one person. And therefore, uh, and therefore, when we baptize someone, we baptize them in the name of Jesus. You've got to recognize it's got to be the name of Jesus. We need to realize that the scriptures teach that there are three distinct persons of the Godhead making up one God. The Father is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Father. The Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. There are three persons of the Godhead. We, uh, there, there's not time this morning to go into exactly how this works. But we've studied on this in the past. How even, even what we talked about in Colossians 3. Do all, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The very next verse, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It'd be really silly for Paul to say, give thanks to Jesus through Jesus. Or give thanks to the Father through Jesus, but they're the same person. We don't do that. We don't speak like that. We don't think like that. Paul was saying there was, in that passage, two members of the Godhead, and he would assert that the Holy Spirit was one too. What this means is, through this teaching, they do not believe in the same God as the New Testament reveals. Just like the Mormons don't believe in the same God, even though they practice immersion baptism. And so no matter if they think that their baptism is for the remission of sins, it's not Jesus' baptism because they do not believe in the God of Scripture. 
It's just like what we talked about with the Mormons. They immerse, they claim it's for the remission of sins, but it's not the same God they worship. Does it matter? Well, in Acts 19, the baptism of John was for the remission of sins when John baptized. It was immersion in water. And yet Paul rebaptized these people. Why? Because it wasn't Jesus' baptism. Well, any other baptism, believing in any other God, does it matter if it's you claim it's for the remission of sins? It's not. Because you are not being baptized properly. The formula for baptism doesn't consist of certain words. But it is done by the authority of God. That's what in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mean. Did you believe that when you were did you believe that when you were baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sins? Did you understand that Jesus died on the cross for the remission of sins and was raised the third day? If you did, then your baptism is valid. But baptism like this, one as Pentecostal church practices, is not baptism in the name of Jesus. In truth, there are many Pentecostal churches that claim to believe in baptism for the remission of sins. But when you dig on down, they don't really believe it. And I have first-hand knowledge that that is true. We have a member here who was Pentecostal. Pentecostal for years. And I studied with her. And I studied with her. And we studied for like four or five years. And she vowed and declared, I was baptized for the remission of sins. Until one night she realized she wasn't. Because we came to the point when, in the study where I asked, if you had died, because she waited a month for baptism, if you had died between the time you expressed your faith and the time you were baptized, would you have gone to heaven? Do you think you would have gone to heaven? She said, yes. Then your baptism wasn't for the remission of sins. And that got her thinking, and two weeks later she was baptized for the remission of her sins. That's Dion, if you're wanting to know who that is, as she is a member here. That we know from experience that people who claim to, to be baptized for the remission of sins, who then also believe that it is okay to wait a month, six weeks, until you have this group, don't really believe in baptism for the remission of sins. And therefore, when dealing with Pentecostal, it is always wise to be baptized again when coming from a denominational background because of so much false teaching surrounding baptism. Which brings us to what the sermon is going to conclude with. What do they believe about public worship? And this is where you get a lot about the Holy Spirit. The public demonstration of the Holy Spirit through supposed speaking in tongues is what differentiates Pentecostal charismatic churches from other denominations. You pass one as you come to worship every Sunday. The group up the hall, across the way up the hall, is a Pentecostal church. Sometimes, if you're coming, uh, if you're maybe in the break, you'll hear some things you don't understand. You say, what's going on? They're saying they're speaking in tongues. That's what they're doing. And what you need to realize about these types of churches, perhaps like the International Pentecostal Holiness Church, they come along and they say... We believe that the, Pentecostal, that the Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire is obtainable by definite act of approaching faith on the part of the fully cleansed believer and on the initial evidence that the reception of this experience is speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. They claim Luke 11.13 teaches that, Acts 1 verse 5 teaches that, Acts 2 1 to 4 teaches that, Acts 8.17 teaches that, Acts 10.44 to 46 teaches that, and Acts 19, verse 6 teaches that. Let's quickly examine what these verses actually teach. Acts 11, verse 3 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That, that passage in that context is not talking about spiritual gifts. When you read that and compare that to other passages... Even, even the parallel passages, you understand 
that that gift of the Holy Spirit is the salvation that God provides. But that passage isn't talking about spiritual gifts. Acts 1, verses 1 to 5, says this. The former account I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do or teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles when he had chosen, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them to depart from, from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Who was that promise given to? That's why we read not just verse 5. We read verses 1 to 5 to know that the apostles were being spoken of there. Matthew 3, verses 7 to 12 is what Jesus is quoting, but I'd like us to get the full context there. In Matthew 3, beginning at verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said, that's John, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree, every, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his, in, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I have to tell people, when they ask me about the baptism of fire, I say, you do not want to participate in that baptism. Because the baptism of fire is a baptism of judgment and a baptism of damnation. It is not the cloven tongues as of fire that we read of in Acts 2. That's something completely different. The baptism of fire is a baptism of, punish, of, of punishment. Now, Jesus and John did say that there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts 1, it was said to the apostles alone. And let's see when it actually came. In Acts 1, instead of starting at verse 4, let's start in chapter 1, in the last verse, in verse 26. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all accord, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled, all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You notice I kept emphasizing they and them. Those are pronouns. You have to know who the subject of those pronouns are. If I introduce a person in a paragraph, then I am allowed to use they, him, her, whatever they are. If I talked about Kala, if I introduced Kala to you, in at the opening sentence I could say she, her, uh, did X, Y, and Z. But if I just write a paragraph and say she did this, you're going to ask, ask the question, who? Who is she? Well, the same is true in Scripture. They, them. Who are they, them? People love to go back to the 120 back in the beginning of the chapter. But verse 26 says the apostles, were, uh, sorry, they, that he was numbered with the 11 apostles. That's the last noun. And they were all together in one place. The now 12 apostles are who is being talked about. Going to Acts 8, we find out how the spiritual gifts were passed on. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem 
heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that might, they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as of yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Notice, Acts 2, when the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit, no one laid their hands on anybody. The Holy Spirit just fell on them. Here, the Samaritans were baptized with water in the name of the Lord Jesus, yet didn't have these gifts of the Holy Spirit. The apostles' hands need to be laid on them. And that's the same in Acts 19 as well. Which leaves us with Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 talks about Cornelius. In beginning of verse 44, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard him speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water there, that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. This direct falling of the Holy Spirit was sent as a sign to the Gentiles or sorry, it's a sign to the Jews that the Gentiles could be saved. It occurred before baptism in water. So it's not a sign that you've already been saved. That didn't happen here. The direct falling of the Holy Spirit occurs in two places. In Acts 2 and here. In Acts 2 it was also for a sign. It was a sign to the Jews that the apostles were speaking the words of salvation. In fact, that was the purpose of miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit in the first century. They were for signs to confirm the word. In Mark 16, verse 20, Mark says, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. We have to remember, they couldn't pick up the Bible like we do. They couldn't turn to Mark 16. They couldn't turn to Acts 10. They couldn't turn to Matthew 3. They couldn't do any of those things. Why? It hadn't been written yet. And so if a prophet came to you and said, I have the word of the Lord, and well, how do I know? There were these signs that followed them. Do we still need these signs today? No. Because we have the complete word of God. In John 20, Verses 30 and 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John wrote the book of John, talked about the many signs that Jesus did, and he said, you know what? Jesus did even more signs than I've written down, but the ones I wrote down... I wrote so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I can believe in Jesus as the Son of God without seeing the signs per personally because of the eyewitnesses who had them. In truth, many of the Pentecostal worship services look exactly what Paul taught against. In 1 Corinthians 14, in verses tw beginning of verse 22, Therefore tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation? Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let it be by two or three at most, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself. 
We must realize that in, when tongues were used, these were actual languages that people could understand. They're not some angelic language, not some Holy Spirit language. They were a real language. But they were more than that. They were a real language that the person speaking it had never learned. I can speak in another language if I learn it. You can speak in another language if you learn it. Speaking in tongues was not that. You never learned it. But everyone wasn't given every language. So if there wasn't an interpreter, then the gift wasn't to be used because it was not edifying. It's sort of like saying, you might say, well, how is that possible? Okay, we're English speakers. If I speak in English, everyone can be edified. However, if I was, had the gift of tongues and I was given the gift to speak in Japanese, and I spoke in Japanese, there's not anyone here who speaks Japanese, is there? That's why I picked that language. If I spoke in Japanese and no one here could interpret it, I might have said to I might have preached a great lesson, but nobody was edified. That's when my preaching would have been futile. You would not have understood it. That's what Paul's talking about here. Everything needed to be done for edification. We had a woman about three or four years ago, it was during COVID, that when we met in the afternoon, there was a woman who came out in tears in the hall. And we went out to see what was wrong. She said, well, I couldn't understand what they were saying. I must not be saved. We tried talking with this woman, but she really couldn't be the, consult that much. But that's a problem. Because even they didn't know what they were saying. And that's what you get in Pentecostal churches. That's what Paul was teaching against here. But we need to realize that miraculous spiritual gifts, including tongues, were temporary. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 12 says, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. In the context of this chapter, Paul is showing the Corinthians the more excellent way that they were to seek. That was the way of agape love, self-sacrificing love. He tells them the reason for this is because there will come a time when spiritual gifts would end, when that which is perfect has come. In short, that which is perfect is the word of God completely revealed. Spiritual gifts were childish. No, not in the sense of insignificant or stupid. Childish as in like training wheels that you put on a bicycle. When you're teaching a kid to ride a bike, you don't usually put get the two-wheel bike to start with. You might start with a three-wheel bike, a tricycle. Then they grow out of that and you say, okay, they're ready for a two-wheel bike, but they're not quite ready to balance on the two wheels, so you put two training wheels on the bike. And then they grow out of that, and now they're ready to balance on the two wheels, and then they can go ride a bike. That was the church in the first century. They didn't have the complete revealed word of God. They couldn't look in their, at themselves in the mirror with the lights on. If I turned off all the lights in here, and you tried looking at yourself in that glass in the back window, you're not going to be able to see yourself that much. You might be able to see a shadow, but you're not going to see yourself that much. However, Paul said that we now we look in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. That's not talking about seeing Christ face to face. Now we can see ourselves face to face. The word of God is going to shine back on us, and we can be known as ourselves. We can be known, am I following God or am I not? And so that's why Paul tells the Corinthians to desire spiritual gifts at that time in the same way that they des it, 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 not in the same way that they desire love. They were to desire spiritual gifts, but they were to, to they were to desire love more. Because if you don't have love, 
Simply having spiritual gifts wasn't going to save you. God's grace is what saved. But spiritual gifts were going to end. And they were going to end while the church was still on earth. If the only thing that was keeping you desiring God was spiritual gifts, you now have nothing and you fall away. However, if you have love, the agape love that God desires, having God remove these miraculous spiritual gifts will, lack, will keep you lacking in nothing. Does belief in the succession of miraculous spiritual gifts matter? Come along and say, well, why does that matter? If I believe in spiritual gifts, does that really change my salvation? And yes, it does. Because for one, the scriptures reveal its soul. The scriptures tell it. And so if we know that it is true, we better believe that it is true. But the second reason is belief in miraculous spiritual gifts today leads to all sorts of other errors. Because not only will Pentecostals claim to speak in tongues, which they aren't, but they'll also claim the gift of prophecy too. Have you ever seen the sign out there coming in? It's an apostle, it's a prophet that's there speaking to them. What is, that, what is that prophet going to be speaking? If it's the word of God from the Bible, they're not a prophet because that's already written down. If it's not in the Bible, then what would God call them? He would call them a false prophet. Though we are an angel from heaven, teach any other gospel than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. We have the complete word of God today. We don't need anything extra. I don't preach anything to you that I can't back up from Scripture. And if I do, you better be telling me I can't. That that's not backed up in Scripture. And that we need to change that. That's why we go to all these verses. Because I am not a prophet. I am not the son of a prophet. I am just someone who preaches the word of God. We need to beware of false prophets. Because they will lead us away from God. So, Pentecostal churches didn't begin on the day of Pentecost and are not the church that Christ built. Many Pentecostal churches do not teach the truth either concerning the authority of Scripture, the plan of salvation, or the worship of the church, especially surrounding the Holy Spirit. Therefore, because Pentecostals aren't following Christ in regards to these things, I cannot be a Pentecostal and be saved by God. But I can be saved by God. I need to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Believe that he came to this earth and died on the cross for the remission of my sins and was raised by the Father the third day and ascended to heaven where he reigns today as King of kings and Lord of lords, following the Holy Spirit who was sent to reveal the complete word of God. If I believe in that and am ready to repent of my sins as that message teaches, I can be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of my sins today. I can become a Christian today. I wouldn't be baptized into the Church of Christ, as, as this local church. I would not be baptized in the Pentecostal church. But I can be baptized into Christ and be added to his universal church. And then have fellowship with the local Christians here. I can do that even today. I'm not ashamed to hold my Lord, nor to defend.